through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Drop it back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample tastic, flows it frastic. I get drastic, hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. Welcome to the MacGuffin, episode 257. I'm Spencer. I'm Greg. Today we're going to talk about Colin Farrell and our, the release of Epic. The new uh, eponymous word that's replaced awesome as the like. Epic, everything. Man. Yeah, if something is even slightly better than good in English now, it's epic, legendary. I like legendary because that's got that How I Met Your Mother, yeah. Barney Stinson. That's anime. gonna be the next animated movie by Blue Sky Studios. It's gonna be sequel to Epic. It's gonna be legendary. I'd be much more excited yeah. about that. Epic means nothing to me really <laughs> in terms of a name. Like it doesn't. It doesn't generate like, ooh, that must be good. It doesn't tell you anything about the story, no, which no. is. It doesn't help an animated film, but either way. Nevertheless, you know, Colin Farrell, a uh, fairly talented actor, yeah. very highly regarded for a while, kind of um, fell off after a bit. I think but... it's interesting that we're to the point now where we can talk about actors whose major careers started in the 2000s, and they can still have a relatively fleshed out and illustrious career. I mean, he had stuff before that, but... I mean, he's a pretty young dude. I, mean... I know, but it's just crazy that we're to the point where like, 13 years, pretty substantial time to have a time career. Time flies, I mean, man, when yeah. you're having fun. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one we're going to talk about is a film that both of us are huge yes. fans of, though, and that is Tiger Land. Yes. Story of Schumacher. A... Joel Schumacher directed, like... Surprising he, me that I would love a Schumacher film well, so much. You know, he and uh, Colin Farrell definitely have some, um, <laughs> some familiar history. with you. Yeah. I mean, well, they then go on to do like phone booth and stuff That's like right, that. That's right, yes. But uh, Tigerland is about a group of recruits going through training at a camp in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. The last stop before Vietnam and where, you know, thousands of people die. And so. Yeah, it's strange too because Tigerland is like a, the nickname for a very specific base in Louisiana yes. in real life that they actually shot at, but then they tried to fictionalize it and give it a different name. So it's like. You like, took the nickname of what the... Yeah, okay. It's, what, a very, it's a very what, weird sort of kind of thing. But essentially the story is like, you know, these people are all wisely afraid of mm -hmm. going to Vietnam. And Colin Farrell's essential role is that he gets people out of having yes. to go. He's the guy that's like knows all the ways for everybody else except for himself to, to manipulate get them. The yeah. To manipulate the system to get them out before they well, get shipped out to Vietnam. I think it's not just he does, does it for, know everything except for himself, but I think it's like there's almost an element of it that he just doesn't want to do it for himself. I mean, I think that's part of it. I yeah. mean, he could get out if he wanted, but I, 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 mean, I think that's sort of the, some of the beauty of it is that like he sees it sort of as like a calling, sort of like a way mm -hmm. to subvert the system. Yeah, it's true. And he gets some satisfaction out of doing that. And, you know... I mean, he's, from the get-go, very anti-war of a character. He's reading yes. the Johnny Got Your Gun story, which is a very anti-war story from mm -hmm. back then. And, I mean, he's def it definitely puts him at odds with, like, his su superiors mm -hmm. and stuff like that. I mean, clearly it's not an issue of, like, him being a bad soldier, though. Mm -hmm. Like, it's one of those situations where it's like, we know you've got the talent, we just need to see you shine, mm -hmm. or something like that. And it just, he doesn't want to shine. And he I mean, be friends was Matthew Davis. Yes. And that relationship really ends up dictating what happens to both of them as he mm -hmm. tries to help out Matthew Davis. And as, and, uh, what, Shea Wiggum? Is that his name? Wig, Wigham? How do you pronounce it? Yeah, Shane Wiggum. From, uh... Boardwalk Empire. Boardwalk Empire. Michael yeah. Shannon actually even has a role in this movie mm -hmm. also. Boardwalk oh, Empire people, roles. Yeah. But yeah, Shea, uh, Shane Wiggum. Wiggum is, uh, kind of the antagonist to, uh, Colin Farrell's character. He's very much, like, personally doesn't like the reputation that Colin Farrell's character has and is very aggressive against him and kind of, there's some times where there's exercises against each other and he maybe goes a little bit further than mm -hmm. the exercise required because he sees it as an opportunity to extract some kind of vengeance on Colin Farrell. Which I mean, I'm sure just perpetuates Colin Farrell's what, desire to get out, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> or just opposition to authority and... I think it's interesting that this film was so, was theatrical because I think its widest release ever theatrical was five theaters. So, I mean, it's theatrical. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think of, like, I mean, it grossed 140000 in the U.S., which is a drop in the bucket for yeah. a $10 million budget. But the thing that, I, I mean, I, I think the circumstance under which I saw it was that I had started to hear things about 
Colin Farrell, mm -hmm. and I just saw that was like on cable one day, and I was like, oh, I should check that out. I mean, everyone's buzzing about him being a great big next new thing. Yeah, I think that was the kind of thing where he was coming up, and everybody talked about this being the early role that he was in that was a sign of how where his career was going to go, excellent directions. And I remember being like, whoa, Schumacher did this anti-war film that like was barely a blip yeah, on the radar. Like right after uh, this was 2000, so this was fairly shortly after like the Batman mm -hmm. movies, after they. <laughs> As, well, as bloated of films as you could possibly yeah, make to go exactly. down to like the slim down little budget movie is pretty remarkable. Exactly. No, none of the actors had like trailers or like makeup or anything. They all kind of lived in the moment to keep keep them to have that bedraggled feel. Oh, they didn't have, they had no trailers, makeup artists, hairstylists, or chairs of any kind. No chairs on the yeah, set. Any of the normal like luxury. Seriously, it was just like <laughs> no sitting down and relaxing. You got to like go plop on the ground or I stand I around. I like how a chair is a luxury. Like, I think that's, that's, that's tough. That's a tough world <laughs> yeah. like there. I mean, it's like... No sitting! <laughs> even still to this day, you know, if I think back on Colin Farrell's career, this probably is my favorite project yeah. he's done. It's a great... Overall, yeah. It's a legitimately great movie. Mm -hmm. and I mean, it's criminally under Yeah, scene. I, mean, I mean, hell, five, th it leaves 140,000, you said? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> I mean, it, it's just like, I don't think a lot of people know of this mm -hmm. film, and I mean... I think I thought it was originally a TV movie because of the, like, how small it was and its budget and the people in it. I was like, oh, is this like an HBO direct to movie yeah. kind of thing? No, no, it's, it's just a good one. Yep. It's a good one. Um, but, you know, it <laughs> wasn't his only war production. No, it wasn't. Because uh, just a few years later, mm -hmm. he did Hearts War. Yeah, with Bruce Willis. With Bruce Willis, yes. And this is Colin Hauser. Kohlhauser. Kohlhauser. Yeah. Why don't I get? Why did I get that guy's first name wrong? Just no, you don't respect Kohlhauser. It's true, clearly. I guess. Clearly, <laughs> it's about a uh, law student who becomes a lieutenant during World War II, is captured and asked to defend a black prisoner of war, falsely yeah. accused of murder. Yeah, yeah. All these people in a prison camp in World War II with, by Nazis, and uh, there's kind of some weird, some bargaining that goes back and forth between uh, Bruce Willis's character and the lead German commandant. And then there's a, a murder, there's black Tuskegee airmen that get entered into it, and then there's a murder, and it's pinned on one of the black new Tuskegee Is it, airmen. Uh, Terrence Howard? Yep. Mm -hmm. Which, I mean, really early for him as well. Yeah. You know, and then there's this whole um, element of, yeah, Colin Farrell is put in the position of having to defend him, mm -hmm. and he has to sort of, you know, deal with um, the allies. Um, Situation yes. as well as trying to find the balance of like, yeah, because as he digs into the murder, he finds out that there's like other secret things that the allies are doing to try to escape that the murder was a cover for, right? And it, it by you know vehemently defending his client, he puts this other stuff, yes, in, at risk, at, at risk, danger, and yeah. so he sort of put, I mean, that's. Heart's War, his mm -hmm. name is Heart. Yes. It's like a moral dilemma. Yeah, and it's about like, you know, where honor lies and like what is this, like, is just law, legal justice more important than like, you know, wartime justice yes. and how they compare. It's interesting that, you know, this is based on a book and there's a lot, it got a lot of criticism, the movie got a lot of criticism, not only for having too many subplots going on. There was a lot going on. Yeah, but also just kind of for its relative, like, deviation from the original book and one of, it's interesting to find out that one of the reasons that happened is because one of the movie's credited writers billy ray said that he never read the novel first off which that's always which good. is which is you know the basis for the that's movie that's classic hollywood though yeah but he says that the fact that he never read it in it he, that he did an interview later and he said that it was a painful admission like he was upset that he did it however his reasoning for it does make sense in hollywood unfortunately which is by the time he came on to the project, the screenplay had gone through so many drafts and revisions mm. that his job wasn't to make it connect to the original book. It was to make the screenplay even feasible, like to fix it, to kind of get the screenplay to work in the first place. Like so, I hear that at the same time, it feels like a bit of a cop out. Oh, totally. I mean, I feel, I mean he I, said painful admission. Dude's already like, oh, I didn't know. If, if anything, the one circumstance I could see is if they were like, here's this, we need it in a week. And then, yeah. like, okay, I see. You but I mean, how many it. writers are credited for this movie? Uh, just three. There's the the, uh, the author of the okay, novel, John Katzenbach, another... and then Terry George is the okay. other writer. So, it's not a lot. Not a lot. But like, I mean, it's it received mixed reviews yeah. from critics. It seemed to receive mixed reviews from audiences. I, it I really enjoy the film. I think it's a really interesting film based on the fact that it seems the the initial 
like set up in the film when you're watching it the first like say 20 or 30 minutes seems like it's so set up to go a specific direction and things continue to change yeah and that's what i enjoy i hear you it. and I, I i would say i enjoy it somewhat but the problem is like the film should be fixated on colin farrow's character mm. but it's really a bruce willis movie at yes. its core like it's yeah. just like it's called Hearts War, but you look at the poster and it's, it's Bruce, Bruce Willis. Willis. Yeah, like, and it's definitely one of those things you can tell. It was like they got Bruce Bruce Willis and this up and coming actor, but clearly Bruce Willis is headlining. But we're gonna make the well, upcoming. Well, that's yeah. almost like I mean, you think about something like um, Terminator Salvation. I kind of mm -hmm. wonder if it's like that yeah. with like Christian Bale, where it's like when Bruce Willis signed on, he's like. I'll be in your film, but yeah. I'm not going to be like second. Wait, it's banana. called Hearts War, yeah. and I'm not Heart. Well, then, okay, we're going to have to rewrite yeah. this all to make my character uh -huh. significant. And I think, I mean, that seems like an entirely plausible situation yeah. because Colin Farrell was not a huge bankable character at this point. It's interesting too because I mean, you. This is one of those. This is one of those few instances that I can think of, other than like say maybe the Jackal, where it's outright and obvious, where Bruce Willis kind of plays a gray area or more villainous type character. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times he's more at odds with Colin Farrell yeah. and the greater good that Colin Farrell's trying to champion. but No, you're, you're totally right. Um, it's interesting seeing him play someone like that who's still being Bruce Willis, like the cold, hard badass, but not necessarily for like that heroic purpose that yeah. we're used to. No, you're true. And it's, it's funny that you talk about this sort of like gray version of Bruce Willis, because mm -hmm. that same year... Uh, Colin Farrell really sort of started to catapult himself into the stratosphere mm -hmm. big time with yes. his role in Minority Report. Yeah. This is the Tom Cruise... Spielberg. Spielberg <laughs> one inspired by Philip K. Dick's mm -hmm. work about uh, a man who works with precogs who then say that he will become a murderer. Yep. They predict the future. They say he's going to be a murderer, and he yeah. has to fight to prove that he is not a murderer and figure out what's going on. Based on the Philip K. Dick story yep. that was originally, I think, set to be a sequel to Total Recall. Mm, interesting. I think the original story is on Mars and still has Quaid as the main as wow, the character. Wow, that would have been kind of interesting. Yeah. But then they kind of they were like, mm, I mean... Colin Farrell's role is essentially um, a man who is skeptical of the precog yes. system and the predicting of the future, and mm -hmm. so he's sort of investigating the system mm -hmm. right at the same time this crime is committed. So he's sort of like he's investigating Tom Cruise's mm -hmm. uh, alleged murder, and he's also sort of skeptical about the system by which they predicted. And yes. you know what initially seems sort of as the villain of the movie, mm -hmm. kind of ends up turning almost to one of the heroes yeah. of the movie by the end. He's more a person that is uh, only a villain because he doesn't know enough information. And as he learns more information, I think he makes d the decisions that are not villainous. Well, I don't even think it's necessarily that. I think it's sort of like he's a villain because he's going against the accepted mm, culture, mm -hmm. which Tom Cruise is, you know, the a good guy. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, if you're going yeah. against what Tom Cruise believes, fundamentally, you must be If you have a cop a movie and you got internal affairs, internal affairs exactly. is always the villain, yeah. even if they're right. Yeah, exactly. You're right. <laughs> That's a great example. And, you know, this is the same sort of thing. He is essentially eternal mm -hmm. affairs. I mean, he's, he's skeptical of the system. And, you know, he does end up proving to be one of the right characters in the <laughs> yeah. movie. And it's sort of like, well, you know, in retrospect, I guess he wasn't that bad in the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we should have listened to him. But, uh, yeah, then, you know, another villain emerges and sort of displaces him. Mm -hmm. But it's, I mean, his role in this is really interesting because it's sort of much more of that gray yes. character. He's one of the few gray characters yes. in the movie. Yeah. Everyone's really very good or mm -hmm. bad. And he's one of the few who sort of has this interesting turn yes. because he's not just good or bad. I think it's interesting, you know, Spielberg, even though... AI was AI before this? AI had to be before this, right? I believe so, yes. Yeah. Even though AI was not great at being a futuristic movie or being entertaining, uh, this movie was did that so well that it's just, it's interesting to see, you know, you wonder, wonder what Spielberg did different other than the source material. Well, one of the things he did different is did a crap ton of, got a crap ton of smart people so, to do research. Yes. AI was the year before this. Okay, okay. Uh, three years before production began, Spielberg assembled a team of 16 future experts in Santa Monica to brainstorm out the year 2054 That's for him. That's awesome. And check out who this list of people he gets. He gets uh, Neil Gershenfield, a professor at the Media Lab at MIT, mm. Sean Jones, director of biomedical research at DARPA, which is the Defense Advanced right. Research Projects Agency, William Mitchell, dean of the School of Architecture at MIT, 
Peter Calthrope, a new urbanism evangelist. Jaron Lanier, one of the inventors of virtual reality tech. Wow. <laughs> Douglas Copeland, an author and comment. Uh, commentator, Stuart Brand, an author, scientist, and co-creator of the Well Online Community, Kevin Kelly, the founder of Wired Magazine, Harold Belker, car designer, and John Underclough, a science and technology wow. advisor for the movie. That's impressive. Like, he got a think tank together and said, develop the year for me so I can make a film in this setting. Like... Thank you, Spielberg. I mean, you. yeah. I mean, it's, it's clearly a really dedication to the craft, which is very awesome. And it's I one mean, of the it, things that shows over best in the movie. It's one it, of those few movies that it still seems very much accurate. You think mm -hmm. about like them reading the digital newspapers mm -hmm. on the train stuff. You think about like iPads and stuff. Yep. We're getting right there about <laughs> now. But uh, I mean, it's it, it's definitely interesting. You think about like it's. Colin Farrell's past releases. Like both of them were not huge theatrical mm -hmm. success, and this one made like almost. 360 million worldwide. So this really sort of put both him and Tom, um, Tom Cruise. This was a huge hit for. Yeah, us and if you're life. if you're being in any way an antagonist versus Tom Cruise in a Spielberg movie that makes this much money, money, money your name is going to yeah. get out there. Yeah. It's going to get out there. So you know, good good on him for that. Mm -hmm. It definitely was a uh, very worthwhile. <laughs> Unfortunately. <party. laughs> Sometimes fame leads you in the wrong direction. <laughs> well, it leads you, leads you in the wrong direction, but. It continues sort of the diversity in Colin Farrell's That's career. True. And we're talking Daredevil. Yes. <laughs> Daredevil is the um, blind lawyer from Hell's Kitchen uh, comic mm -hmm. by Marvel. Yep. This time it was played by Ben Affleck in mm -hmm. the titular role with Jennifer Garner as um, Electra. Electra. This John sort of... Favreau directed, I believe. Right? No. No. No, really? no, no. He was just. Uh, Rick wrote? Didn't he? I swear he, he, had just, some he was in it. In he, was, he was an actor in it. He was the sidekick to Ben Affleck. Yeah, but I, thought, I swear. It was, that he no, was... it was directed by Mark oh. Stephen Johnson. Okay. Yeah, he was just Ben Affleck's like fan okay. slash sidekick. Um, uh, I think it's his involvement that, in the Iron Man yeah, movies that he's yeah. also a sidekick yeah. in the cut. Kind of, okay, Sorry. and he did also direct. a Marvel movie. Yes. <laughs> but I mean, the role of Ben Affleck was as Bullseye. Yes, one of uh, Daredevil's got me thinking Iron Man. Sorry, one of Daredevil's signature villains. Signature villains, which um, would be all well and good. But they also decide to throw in the Kingpin, mm -hmm. which is another one of Daredevil's yep. signature villains. This is the classic, classic Batman. superhero problem. Yeah. Too many villains. And then Elektra, who's also kind of villainous, even though she joins in his side. But initially, she's villainous. It's yeah. like, really? We need an intro story with three villains? Yeah. It, and I mean, two heroes, kind of? at the side. Like, what? And then it was like, you know, it was sort of the effects were really terrible. In particular, there's this end sequence on a, was it a organ? With yes. Ben Affleck and Colin Farrell, which just about made me pull out my hair. And you know, the sad thing is this movie was originally going to be really low budget, kind of just a, 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 a low budget film. But the success of Spider-Man, they went back and they added a huge amount to the budget and said, amp up the special effects. Yeah. Which post effects never are as successful. If they're not yeah. in the initial conception, they're not going to have the same yeah. level of detail and quality. I mean, but I, I mean, I don't necessarily dislike Ben Affleck as um, Daredevil. I mean, he <laughs> was put terrible. He was put there, uh, or sort of pushed into it by Kevin Smith. Definitely yeah, there's some credit. And he, there. Ben Affleck, has pretty much said that because of this experience of both playing a superhero and also having it monumentally shit on, he's never going to do another superhero role. Well, and I don't blame the dude. He's getting old. He doesn't need to anymore. Anyway. I, I mean, I think he could be good. I mean, I, I hope he directs a Justice League movie. I think he'd be very good at that. I mean, I just, I think, you know, Daredevil was sort of in that niche of like Iron Man, where before the movie came out, it wasn't a popular enough public figure to really make it a huge success okay, like I can you know see that. like Iron Man sold people because it was a good movie yes. it wasn't because Iron Man was such a popular character That's true. that people came to see it. and That's Daredevil's true. in that Even same though, sort of niche. Yeah, yeah. like if it had been a great Daredevil movie people would have been become fans That's of the character That's definitely but true. a lot of people are like who's Daredevil and a blind lawyer yeah. like he does he uses sonar for his attack like it was just so sort of weird mm -hmm. and the intro movie just is not well done i mean i hear there's a director's cut which is a better version of it but, but it's still not a fantastic movie and colin farrell like he's kind of funny in it i mean his character is kind of snide kind of mm -hmm. like uh sarcastic yes but like for the most part, he just feels over the top. Yeah. Interestingly enough, his accent in the film is the first... That's actually Colin Farrell's true accent. This is the first time he was able to use his own Irish accent in an American movie. He does a great American accent, though. Like, Seriously. You, you, would, I, you would not know he's... So like, much so that when... I think the first time I saw Colin, this movie, I was like, wow, your accent, fake accent, is atrocious. The great, <laughs> it's <a tr> the <laughs> greatest fake accent I've <laughs> yeah. ever heard. Um, I also think it's interesting, considering where they've gone with this, that this was the first time that there was a sound effect 
added over the opening Marvel logo of the pages flipping, which is like a benchmark in their productions yeah, it's now. That's now like standard. Yeah, this was the first time they added that like yeah. noise over it. But I mean, this is sort of during the period, much like you know Ben Affleck did, kind of in the same period where. Um, you think of Colin Farrell as this tremendous actor. Mm -hmm. He was starting to get into a position where he's working on bigger films, and the work he was pushing out there wasn't necessarily as interesting and thoughtful as yeah. the stuff he had done like, before. And so it was like, like did booth. I overestimate this guy's yeah. talent as an actor? And, and it made me really booth and Alexander both came out, and they yeah. were both just yeah. not good, and he was the head. It's Colin Farrell! It was, oh. I, I think you could chalk him into one of those groups of people who you probably could say did not have the best project selection yep. at different points in their career. And I mean, yeah. it's sort of, he sort of bounced back, though, in more recent years. Mm -hmm. For example, we're going to talk about In Bruges. Yes. One this, of my, probably it goes Tigerland and then In Bruges as my favorite Colin Farrell. Yeah, this is definitely up there. I have to, I'd have to look, like re-look at all the films he's in, but yeah, I, I love this up there, too. This is about a uh, hitman named Ray and his mm -hmm. partner who await orders from their ruthless boss while they wait in In Bruges. Yep. Um, Which is... Uh, town of Belgium. Yeah, which Ray very much does not want to be because mm -hmm. it's essentially like a little town. It's like a, a town lit with nothing. Yeah, and Ray, which is Colin Farrell's character, is very much like big city boy. Yeah. Flashy cars. Finds it just very boring. Mm -hmm. I mean... And Brendan Gleeson playing the other uh, hitman. I forget his character's name. Ken. Uh, Ken. Yeah. And they're sent there after a hit goes wrong. Yes. Um, films directed by Martin McDonough. I believe it was his directorial debut. I think so. Um, Seven Psychopaths was his follow-up, right? Yes. Or, yes. Yeah. But I mean, uh, I mean, not it, a bad one-two punch. Those two. Not films. a bad one-two punch. And the film is interesting. I mean, I think I and probably a lot of people became aware of it from the Academy Awards. Mm. It got its its nominations really were like, what is this movie? Why is mm, this like? Mm -hmm. Let's see. It got nominated for best original screenplay for Martin McDonough. And that's pretty much it. I remember just the footage of the mm. sequence they showed from the yeah, movie. And I think both Brennan Gleeson and Colin Farrell got Golden Globe nominations, or, or uh, at the very least nominations. Colin, Colin Farrell won. Okay. So he got that at the Golden Globes, and it was nominated for Best Comedy or Musical, and Brennan Gleeson was also nominated for Best Performance in a Comedy nice. or Musical. Uh, yeah, in order to create the holiday season feeling, they put Christmas decorations all over Bruges, but then they needed to keep filming, so they kept the festivities up until March, the end of March. Uh, the town council actually had to make an official communication to the people of Bruges and tell them why, so they didn't just start tearing them down, because they were still filming in it. Yeah, so this was uh, Mar McDonough's uh, feature-length debut, nice. which is amazing for, you know, first time first time feature director. He also wrote the thing, got yeah. made for a cameo, where if that doesn't speak to him, as a uh, uh, director writer, that mm -hmm. I mean, that explains sort of the excitement over Seven Psychopaths yes. finally coming out last year. And, and I enjoy it when like you have somebody who gets like a nomination for best original screenplay, and the following is also true, which is the word "fuck" and its derivatives are said 126 times in the 107-minute film, making an average of 1.18 fucks per minute. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's pretty amazing. I, I love stuff like that. Like when Quentin Tarantino gets nominations yeah. for screenplays and the dude's like, he's just proliferated with swearing. Yeah. And it's like, well, you know, maybe a rating system isn't necessarily the best indicator no. of no. anything. But <laughs> thing, I mean, the other thing you gotta think about with this movie is sort of like, I, the one thing I would say was sort of shocking was um, the advertising of it versus mm. the actual film. Yes. Like, I felt like the, it was advertised much more as a comedy. Yeah, it was like this Hitman comedy. And, and it's pretty dark. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's some pretty the, dark the moments. The reason, the hit that went wrong is pretty... That's pretty dark. I mean, yeah. some of the stuff that occurs while they're in Bruges uh, Everything with Ralph Fien, Fen, Fiennes', Fiennes yeah. character. is pretty dark. Like, like it, he's their boss and he's fucking hardcore. Yeah, like. I mean, you know, it's, it's all well and good well. Um, Colin Farrell and, and Brendan Gleeson are just Gleeson hanging just, out. Yeah, yeah, like that's all well and good, but when stuff starts to come to in Bruges as well is when it starts to get pretty Also, good. this movie has a crazy, hilarious, uh, I want to say, isn't it Peter Dinklage plays, is in this film? Um, was it Peter Dinklage, the little guy? Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I probably, maybe not? I don't think it was. I think oh, it was yeah, Jordan right. Prentice. Oh, yes, yes. But yeah, that whole, that whole sequence the, is very The funny. actors yes. and <laughs> the, the filming the movie in, in Bruges yeah. at the same yeah. time. That's yeah. pretty good. You're right, that is pretty good. Um, moving right along, though, he went on to do another major production, just, I believe, a year Jeez. later. Yeah. Crazy Heart. Yeah. This is the Jeff Bridges mm -hmm. story about a faded country musician who was forced to reassess his dysfunctional life during a doomed romance. Yeah, you basically have uh, Jeff, or 
Jeff Bridges? Jeff Bridges, yeah. yeah. I almost Academy Award Bridges. winning Jeff yes. Bridges for the movie. Jeff Bridges is like a washed up country western singer who's trying to revitalize his, his career. And uh, Colin Farrell plays like the next up and coming, what's his name? Tommy Street? Sweet. Sweet. Tommy yes. Sweet, yeah. The next up and coming country star. And. Uh, so it's like Nashville, essentially. Well, before Nashville, yeah. but but yeah. they're less. But it's less about them competing because what hap- uh, Jeff Bridges' character is notoriously good songwriter as mm. well as country western star. So he wants to try to work together and do a duet with Tommy Sweet to revitalize right, his career. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. none of the studios want to take this superstar and make him do a duet. And so while he's trying to vitalize his career, he meets uh, Maggie Gyllenhaal and her, who has a young son as well. And the fact that Academy Award nominated, nice, uh, you know, Jeff Bridges' alcoholism basically ruins that relationship. Yeah, I mean that could be a problem. You know, when he takes the kid to a bar and then just le- forgets that he's there and goes home without him. If you call that a problem, a little bit of a problem. <laughs> but then, interestingly enough, he kind of hater. he he. On, well, I thought this movie was totally going to try to go with that like competition, who's the more successful. But right, interestingly yeah. enough, the end result of the film, slight spoiler, sorry if you haven't seen the movie, wah, it, wah. is that he actually goes on to write a song about his failed relationship with Maggie Gyllenhaal and then give that to Colin Farrell's character to perform. So he actually goes like backstage and gets the songwriting credits for rather than trying to make his own career back. I mean, the thing that I find remarkable about this is, you know, it's not just, you know, lip-synced. No, Jeff yeah. Bridges, like, Jeff Bridges he, and Colin Farrell both did their own singing. But Jeff Bridges has developed an entire career as a musician yeah. that's gone out since this. Mm-hmm. Like, he just was in Seattle, like, a month ago. Yeah, he put an album out, like, either right before or right after this movie came out. And that, I mean... I, I, I think that spe- well, speaks to who Jeff Bridges is and how significant probably the experience of making this movie yeah. has been on him. It was neat, too, because there's this moment like near the end of the film where both Jeff Bridges and Colin Farrell kind of come out on stage together and kind mm-hmm. of like show that they don't have any kind of feud and that they're working together. And what they did, it was neat. The writer-director, Scott Cooper, wanted to make that concert scene really authentic. So what he did is he went to Toby Keith. Uh, famous country western singer and said can we film a live segment of our film during your set break that's pretty cool so it's like you know um, when they film you know at baseball stadiums mm-hmm. during a play- playoff game exactly like. so what they did is they had uh, it was at uh, Albuquerque's Journal Pavilion New Mexico represent uh, the production had 10 minutes in which to film Jeff Bridges and Colin Farrell performing in front of 5 cameras and an audience of 12,000 fans uh, Cooper's insistence on the element of surprise, he didn't tell anybody except for Toby Keith, also, actually paid off because essentially all the audience went ballistic over the fact that these two celebrities yeah, were coming out and I don't doing think their you'd own. Have any problem, yeah, getting excitement. Exactly, and it did, and it helped the fact that you know they did their own singing, and it was so ridiculously excited that people popped out their cell phones and uh, like within hours the whole thing was on YouTube before yeah. the movie was even done that's being funny. filmed. Like, that's how crazy people went in uh, real life. Like, that, that, I mean, that's technology today, too. But like, that's just nothing... kind of a neat idea to, like, hey, we're going to take a famous country but western it's, stand. It's like... sort of like, yeah, you know, we are talking about with Mission Impossible last time, where they had to have, like, a mm-hmm. fake crew yeah, exactly. so that people would pay yeah. attention. Yeah. Like, you know, nowadays, like, anytime any famous person's anywhere, like, they're filming it on YouTube. So it's like, yeah. if you actually went on YouTube, you probably could piece together an entire There's film. There's YouTube uh, pre-special effects of, like, all the big movies now. The new second yeah. Spider-Man, the new Teen- Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, yeah. like dudes walking around in mocap suits. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit disappointing. I try and avoid that when yeah, possible. Yeah. But he wasn't all sort of serious times <laughs> no, with no. his work, because <laughs> just, you know, a couple years later, he was in Horrible Bosses. Love this movie. The comedy uh, starring Jason Bateman, Charlie Day, and Jason Sudeikis, mm-hmm. uh, about three friends who hate their bosses yes. because they're all awful. Yes. And they kind of hatch a plan to, you know, kill them. Yeah. And, and they figure, you know, if they each kill each other, find somebody to either help them or kill each other's bosses, that there won't be any, it won't be pinned on them because yeah. they won't have the connection. Right. And, you know, when you say it like this, it sounds kind of um, really dark, mm-hmm. like a black comedy, mm-hmm. but it's much more upbeat and funny. It's much more than just that. a comedy. Yeah. I mean, the, the horrible bosses are Kevin Spacey, Jennifer Aniston, and Colin Farrell. Yes. And Jamie Foxx has an incredibly great, great role. Yeah, I forget yeah. his character's name. Bad Motherfucker or something. Yeah, let me look it up. I'll look it up. Please. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, they're so 
Uh, Dean M. F. Jones. Yeah, Dean. Yeah, Dean Jones. Motherfucker Jones. Yeah. that's what he goes by. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it's 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 played very much as a sort of over the top kind mm-hmm. of like Colin Farrell's character is like this completely drugged out, yeah, womanizing, yeah, in- he, incompetent you know, boss. Jason Bateman, who works the corporate life, and Kevin Spacey is his like asshole take all the credit boss. Yep. You have Jason Sudeikis works at like a car dealership for Donald Sutherland, who dies, and then Donald Sutherland's son Colin Farrell takes Inherits over, it. who's like a coke fiend and like wants to fire all the fatties and then you have yeah. charlie day is a dentist who a or dental, a dental assistant, assistant yeah. who works with jennifer aniston who's always sexually harassing yeah her, which is a great role for her probably one of my favorite jennifer aniston roles because it's so outside of her normal type yeah she really really played into yeah it. Like, she was she, really into that role this like, show she, shows it, it was supr- it was probably one of the better parts of the movie for me because it was so outside of her i think i think pretty much I mean, the cast all around was so well done, mm-hmm. um, and they worked together too. Especially, you know, um, Charlie Day, Jason Sudeikis, and yes. Jason Bateman. They really seem like genuine friends. They were a great friends. trio. And I mean, it makes sense that they've talked about doing horrible bosses too in a year mm. or two now. <laughs> <laughs> I also find it interesting with a movie that has a title like that uh, to help promote the film. Warner Brothers Picture Canada set up a 12-foot voodoo doll resembling a corporate boss in downtown Montreal. And then people were given the chance to vent their frustrations at the doll by stabbing and hitting it with large needles. They were also encouraged to share their best and worst boss story for the chance of winning passes to an advanced screening. Let me do a little blowing of your mind, though. Uh, I'm ready. Did you realize who directed this film? Seth Gordon. Okay, and you know what he's done? No. (laughs) <laughs> He's done King of Kong, the documentary. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. He did Four Christmases after that. The um, Vince Vaughn, um, oh, yeah. Reese Witherspoon uh-huh. comedy. Mm. Mm. He directed one of the segments during the Freakonomics documentary. Weird. Very curious. Okay. Uh, did Horrible Bosses after that. Okay. Since he's gone on to do Identity Thief. Uh, like, Melissa McCarthy, Jason Bateman, right? Yes, exactly, uh. yeah. So clearly he and Jason Bateman get along. And his two upcoming projects that are listed on IMDb, we'll see what happens first, are War Games. <laughs> like, I don't know why you would be remaking that. That just sounds like a bad idea. And then Horrible Bosses too. So the guy pretty much is like, you know, was it the Star Trek uh. phenomenon where you alternate, like, good thing, uh-huh. bad thing? So, uh. I don't know. Come on, dude. Come on. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. So, uh, really inter- funny movie. You should definitely check out if you haven't seen it. I think it it had a really good uh, the the I say the marketing for it really appropriately set up the movie as being overly dark, and I like that because then when the movie was not as dark, I think it probably brought more people in by being more funny than the initial premise yeah. might have done it. I mean, there's an element of that. I think I, I think it was wise that they didn't advertise as being too dark too. Like yeah, they exactly, did yeah. make it like yes. at least seem somewhat yes. over the top. So Definitely. I, I think yeah. It could have gone a very different direction, oh, yeah. but I was glad with the direction mm-hmm. of it. Which brings us to this Friday, though, uh, May 24th, Epic. Epic! <laughs> you, re- you really like that word, yeah. Uh, this is I don't. the new uh, animated family film from Blue Sky Studios, who've done Ice Age, Rio. Rio. Robots. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. You know, I, I mean, I, I like the Ice Age films yeah, well yeah. enough. I, I really like Rio. I think it should have mm-hmm. won the Academy Award for yep. that year over I agree. Rango, for sure. Rio 2 will be awesome, just because yep. it's the first one was so good. Yes, uh, but, you know... Epic is about a girl who gets sort of shrunk and gets mm-hmm. mixed up in this world within the forest near yes. her father's house mm-hmm. and all the war between the little people. There's it's a war between um, sort of the balance in nature, like okay. there's decay and there's sort of like growth, growth. Gotcha. and uh, the decay portion wants to take over and kill all the growth people during a transition where there's sort of like this hundred year cycle and they have to transition who's the leader of the growth I see. which is played by Beyonce okay and um, they try and they want to stop that from happening because then they can just there's no They'll growth take over yeah, yeah. Uh, the main voice is by Amanda, Amanda Seyfried Seyfried yeah. yep um, she gets shrunk down chasing her dog right and that was yes yeah. exactly uh, the m- male protagonists are Josh Hutcherson, who mm-hmm. plays sort of the rebellious member of the growth mm-hmm. group, and Colin Farrell plays sort of like the leader of the army yeah. of the the growth group, who's mm-hmm. sort of friends with Josh Hutcherson's yes. father. Um, you know, it's is it epic, Spencer? Because I think you I what, saw it th- today. Yeah, I literally saw it like it ended like an hour ago. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 
I wouldn't describe it as epic. I would say it's pretty formulaic, but mm -hmm. I don't think that is quite as catchy of a title. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a great animated movie. Yeah. Formulaic! Perhaps. Because then you just set it up as an obvious trope, and then you just break all those tropes. It would be much more fun. Yeah. You can take this for what you want. I will. The director of this movie, Chris Wedge, mm -hmm. was one of the co-directors of Ice Age. Okay. So that's positive. He was also one of the directors of Robots. Mm. One of Greg's favorite movies, clearly. Mm. Um, you know, Williams. Mm. I, I, think, I think the cast chemistry together is decent. I found it funny that Colin Farrell um, uses natural accent. Oh, okay. Like, there's really no rhyme or reason to why the characters in the uh, the movie had, like, accents, accents or whatever. Accents of any kind, but he does. Even though they all live together yeah. in the same region, for whatever reason. Which is you know, someone's like, backyard, yeah, essentially. Yeah. Well, you know, whatever. You're not going to really <laughs> investigate why some people are like... So Chris O'Dowd is a slug with a, like, um... Was with whatever Scottish, his accent is. Yeah. Scottish accent? I don't Irish remember accent. where he's from. Um, but, you know, then a season sorry is also one. I guess they're different types of slugs. One is one a snail, one is a slug. Maybe that's it. I don't know. But, you know, the animation is pretty well done. The 3D is is, is decent. You know, it's not great, but it's, it's pretty decent. I mean, I like a lot of the people involved. Um, it's, it's okay. I wish I could be more enthusiastic about it. But, yeah. I mean, Colin Farrell is decent in it. And Christoph Waltz is the villain, so how can you complain yeah, yeah, yeah. about that? And he probably also accented... Yes. Unnecessarily, yeah. Well, yeah. unexplainably yeah. accented. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So, you know, <laughs> and I, there's something I enjoy about, you know, Lots fighting... places have a north. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> they can... Whatever. It is what it is. But, but there's, it's there's, not ever. There's something fun about, you know, Colin Farrell and Christoph Waltz mm. essentially facing off, though. Yeah. Like, there is a rivalry between mm -hmm. the two of them. And, you know... I, I kind of like the concept of the movie. I, I mean, it's sort of like Honey, I Shrunk the Kids meets Fern Gully in some ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's all about sort of like the importance of nature or uh -huh. like the world we live in. Mixing and, a little bit of the borrowers. Exactly, yeah. I mean, it's it's okay. Like, it's not terrible. That's if what you, we, another title for it should yeah, be. It's, it's not okay. terrible. Just, it's if, okay. If you have kids, it's not bad. Um, but I, I did, yeah, I, I will not be raving. Take your kids because if they cry and scream through it, you won't miss anything. I don't think they'll cry and scream through it. No. Like, I didn't remember hearing any kids cry and scream. Though, the Some people semi have adult. Kids. Next to me was saying like every line uh, like after a while like, oh my god, there he is, it's your dad. Like I'm just like, really we're still doing this? Okay. Anyway, you know, decent movie, not great, not epic to say the least. Yes. that's how I would term but it. But at least you know Colin Farrell's getting some voice acting work. G getting it's some a, voice acting work. It's, and, a, it's you know, a good world to get into. And it's been a while since you know there's been something like this for kids really yeah. in the theater. It means so. when they make the Fifth Ice Age, he might probably have a small role in it because he'd worked with Blue Sky before. Probably. That's the yeah. hope. You might be right. It'd be like a I don't know a weird Irish saber tooth tiger or something. Yeah. I, don't know, I don't know what creatures lived in Ireland in the Ice Age, so yeah. I can't tell you. No, you're right. I mean, but. Um, let us know what you think of Colin Farrell. Mm -hmm. There's all sorts of movies about his that Plenty we didn't bad. talk about. Plenty of bad there's ones. Some, there's some not so bad ones either. Yeah, that's uh, true. There's some. He's got good. some stuff in there yeah. that's decent. But uh, we'd like to know what your which ones are your favorites or which ones you hate. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can let us know at MacGuffinPodcast.com, uh, Twitter.com slash MacGuffinCast, Facebook.com slash MacGuffinPodcast, phone number 323-761-9842. We're on iTunes, we're on Blip, we're on Miro, we're on Roku. Check and you get glue to get some stickers to place all over your friends' faces. Yeah. Go to iTunes, download us there, give some stars, mm -hmm. we'll give you a shout out or something, yep. and give some thumbs on the YouTube. And some comments, so, yeah. we like those, we'll respond to you. And, uh, we'll holla back at you. Holla back at you. As one way to holla back, <laughs> boys. We're not going to hollers at your boy, because yeah. that is taken by yeah. another member of the McGuffin. I have that copyrighted though, so yeah, I can't that's in true. fact do that's that. true. <laughs> and uh, join us next time for a DVD rundown of the week of May 28th, yeah. and uh, we'll see you next time. Magneto can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. This tight don't even try to bite the side of style. Mr. Spock can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The board can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels all